Hare Krishna to everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning inspiration. My name is Savya Sachitas. I'll be hosting you today. We have a very special guest today with us, His Holiness Janananda Goswami Maharaj. So I will just introduce Maharaj by reading a short bio. And then after that, We'll give some house rules and then let Maharaj speak to us on a very interesting topic indeed. So His Holiness Jayananda Goswami Maharaj joined ISKCON in London and was initiated by Srila Prabhupada in 1972. Maharaj has served in various countries around the world, but in the last few years, he has really dedicated himself to supporting ISKCON France Yatra. For most of the lockdown, Maharaj has been serving in at ISKCON New Mayapur, France, engaged in a variety of practical services and providing much support to the devotees who stay in New Mayapur. So, Srila Prabhupada stayed in New Mayapur three times and installed Sri Sri Krishna Balaram there. New Mayapur is a farm community and the temple, which is an old French castle, is the only remaining ISKCON property in Europe where Srila Prabhupada stayed. His Holiness Jananda Maharaj is an exceptional practitioner and exponent of Kirtan, Hayanam, and book distribution in the line of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Maharaj's quick wit, humility, and loving personal nature is very uplifting and inspires us all to take shelter of the lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada and Lord Krishna. So the house rules before we begin is that please try to keep your cameras, your videos on, so that Maharaj can be able to see all our faces and make it personable. All mics are muted and will remain so until 10.45, at which time then you can switch them on so we can have a question and answer. If you have a question, please raise your hand and you'll be unmuted and you can speak. Also, please feel free to write your questions in the chat box. Those who are watching on Facebook can also type their questions there and we'll have them read out to Maharaj. So thank you for coming once again and special warm welcome to His Holiness Jananda Goswami and all the devotees. Maharaj, thank you for coming and uh, we'll hand over to you for your class. Hare Krishna, Savasachi Prabhu. Thank you, Mr. Kipasindi Babicha, Pnam Pavanavio, 
Vaishnavevyo namo namaha Shri Prabhupada ki jai 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 Radha Mahadama Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Mahadama Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Mahadama Kunjabi Hari Kopi Janava Givara Mahari Kopi Janava Givara Kopi Janava Givara Mahari Sankirtan ki. Jai. Brihat Madanga ki. Jai. 
Oh, glorious to the assembled devotees. Oh, glorious to Sri Gurangaranga. Glorious to Sri Krabhat. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya. Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale. Sri Mate Bhaktivedanta Swaminiti Namane. Namaste Sarasate Devi. Gauravani Pracharine. Nevasesha Sanyavadi. Pastichade Shatarine. Hare Krishna. Welcome, devotees, on this. Bright morning, at least here in France, is a very bright, sunny morning. And uh, this morning, we're going to talk about a very, um, you could say, bright subject matter, a very uh, popular subject matter. What is it called? When death is knocking at your door. Huh? And of course, we put a little subtitle help. It's not something that most people like to talk about uh, too much. Of course, when their family, everyone's experienced probably a family member passing or a friend passing away, um, somebody we are close with, and it may be a bit of a shock in our lives. It may be a bit of a wake-up call for a few moments. Uh, perhaps we've had some near-death experience. Well, anyway, we'll start. We're going to go back a few years to Africa. Yes, Africa, but not South Africa. This is East Africa. It's February the 14th, if my memory serves me correctly, 1980. In a small town called Masindi in Uganda. You've probably never heard of it. It's a small town north of Kampala. And... Somehow or another, we are in the marketplace distributing what's called Rudy Kwamongo. Rudy Kwamongo, as you may know, if you know Swahili, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, means back to Godhead. So in that part of the world, the predominant language is Swahili. So that time we only had Rudy Kwamongo, we had no books. So I, I brought, I was actually based in Nairobi, Kenya. And it was a few months after the departure of Idi Amin, the notorious dictator ruler of Uganda, who sent most of the Indians to England. And uh, the Tanzanian army had come in and chased him away to Sudan and further. So one young boy had joined, young man had joined our temple in Nairobi. He was from Uganda. Millions of people had run away from Uganda to save their lives. Many of them were in Kenya. We had a few Ugandan devotees. And uh, this young man was very eager to return to Uganda. And so he asked me if I would please come with him. He said he had a farm and a house which we could turn into a Hare Krishna ashram. And he lived just outside of Masindi. So we did. We went with him in February to Uganda. And we arrived in Uganda in a place called Tororo. Tororo is a border town small town. Previously, a lot of Indians had lived there. There was still a, there were still temples there. We stayed overnight and we got arrested by the local police. They released us after some time and we went on to Kampala. On the train, we got arrested. And uh, then in Kampala, we were released again, and then we made our way to Masindi. 
And in the Cindy, we went to his house, which was a little mud hut in a village just outside of the small town of Masindi. And it was really a mud hut. There were no walls inside, just some kind of, maybe what I don't think it was bamboo, but some kind of, you know, those type of separations, making areas in the in a little, little, very small, but quite a small hut. He lived there just with his mother. Everyone else, maybe they've been killed or gone, whatever. And or he, his mother was living there, let's say, and we arrived. And the next day, I ventured into the town. There were no buses or within the town, that is, and there were no transport. The whole country had been more or less devastated by either Idi Amin or the Tanzanian army when they came in. So there we were. And I went alone into the town, not knowing what to expect. Exciting. Those days we would had a little bit more boldness, you could say, to do things like this. Um, very dangerous country. When we were in Kampala, we stayed in what was called the Sanatan Dharm Mandir. And there were still a few Hindus left, not many. And all night long, there were just gunshots going off all night in the city. It was uh, still wild, very wild. The place was, I mean, roads were blown up. and The shops, there was nothing in the shops practically. Everything had just been, you know, stolen. And uh, so in the Cindy, I went to the marketplace and started chanting alone. And many, hundreds and hundreds of people gathered around, as you can imagine, hundreds of people. The first time ever, I think it was the first ever kirtan in Uganda, as far as I know, I never heard of anyone going before. And uh, hundreds of people gathered around. And, uh, and then after some time, in my bag, I had about a hundred copies of Rudy Kwamungo. And I held up the magazine and said, Rudy Kwamungo, Penny Mojo, means literally 10 cents, next to nothing, but something to at least um, keep the hordes from just stampeding. And uh, within no time, all the magazines had been sold or whatever. And there was a lot of challenges from members of the crowd. I don't know who they were. They were certainly Christians, that's for sure. And there were a lot of heckling and a lot of challenges. And all of a sudden it stopped. Everything stopped. I didn't know what was going on because I was completely out of touch with the news. Suddenly everything went kind of like really eerie, eerie means scary. And everything went semi-dark. The sky went almost like a purple color. And everyone suddenly, everything stopped. And I saw people getting out kind of these, I don't know what you call them, these type of things. You look up into the, into light, you know, some sort of screen thing. And they're all looking up in the sky. And I realized what had happened. It was a full eclipse of the sun. It was really weird, weird weird so then everything kind of just petered out and i just kind of walked away and went back to the village but a very strange feeling came across me okay so now we move on to the next subject <laughs> <laughs> what to say we could do and go back to that or we could finish it well let's finish it in case Time finishes us because we don't know when our time's up. Any one of us, it could be at any moment. Huh? So I walked back to the village, which generally sometimes a tractor was passing by and we would be able to hitch a lift. But most days, I went a few days actually, um, prior to this, maybe one or two days. And I walked back to the village and I felt really strange. And within a short period of time, I developed the most, probably the most intense fever of my life. Um, and it was, it felt, I mean, you know, I'm sure you've had 
different sicknesses, but I never had a fever like this anyway. And I thought it was time to die. And I was really, really sick. And I was just kind of lying down, and sweating like anything in this kind of straw bed of some kind. And, uh, and the time went on uh, overnight. It was just all night. It was really, oh, I can't remember exactly. I think it was all night, just the fever. And then I may be slightly wrong, but I, I think it was the next morning, suddenly there was a noise, loud noises, bang, bang. And I could hear this Ugandan, young Ugandan man I was staying with, it sounded like he was being beaten in, across the partition. And then suddenly the curtain opened and in came two ginormous Tanzanian army officers. Passport! Document! I got out my passport. Forgery. Forgery. He snatched the passport. Money. I'd hidden most of the money in a hidden place in the underground, not underground, but in a hidden corner of the room. So I gave them what I had. Black market, he said. And then, boom, he took the money. He took the passport and stormed out. Somehow or another, you know, one thing you experience is sometimes when you're in a very precarious situation and something even more precarious comes along, you kind of forget your, your previous precarious situation. One takes over the other. And then I went back into the feverish mode and all day long just lying there. And then when the evening came, you could hear noises of vehicles approaching motorbikes and trucks coming up the valley to the village and i could hear people noise in the village you know flashing lights and and running and screaming and different things and it sounded like they were all running out of the village because they knew what it was it was a tanzanian army trucks coming up the valley and that usually meant death that was one of their ways that they i guess they enjoyed themselves while they were there and uh, suddenly boom in they came and they gave them the uh, ugandan boy a little beating and then they came to where was with machine guns up up I had no choice. It was amazing. Mind over matter, maybe. But we suddenly jumped out of the bed and into the truck. They made us climb into this truck, this army truck. So sitting in the back of this army truck with about 12 Tanzanian armed soldiers. This is in the evening, it's already dark. And myself and this uh, Ugandan friend sat in the truck and the truck started driving towards the jungle. Every day we heard in the news that you know, some foreign missionary had disappeared, never to be seen again. I, 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 was, I was asking my Ugandan friend, are they saying anything? He said, yes, they're taking us to shoot us. And this is a common thing in, at that time. Anyway. So uh, I guess it's a kind of a, a different type of a near-death experience. But uh, as we're in the truck, and then the dawn on us, they're going to shoot us. So what do you do in a situation like that? What to do, mummy? Call out for mummy, help, save me, forgive me. What do we do? What would you do? You're in the middle of nowhere. 
really in the middle of nowhere. And there's, there's nothing you can do. You're, you're just driving into the wilderness along this kind of jungle track into the jungles with just a truckload of armed Tanzanian army men. So amazing how Krishna works. Now, I, I can only say this is just an example, which sometimes we experience of Krishna's mercy. Um, there's, if I can find it, let me see if I can find it. There's an interesting verse um, where Krishna says how he protects his devotees. And I may not be able to find it, but it describes how the Lord protects his devotees. It's not normal. It's not the way we normally think of protection. When we think of protection from the material point of view, we normally think of protecting the body. But the actual, actual way that the Lord protects the devotees um, is that he protects us from fear. Fear is the real pain. It's not so much the, that's also a pain, especially if you have physical illnesses or so, so forth. Um, but the real thing is protecting us from fear. Well, I can't find the verse right now, but there's a nice verse where Krishna explains this, that he, he always protects his devotees. And the main way that he protects them is he protects them from being afraid. And suddenly it came across me and it was, I'm normally quite a you know, nervous sort of sensitive person, but somehow or another Krishna's special mercy came upon us. And we, we felt no fear, we rather felt some kind of pleasure, some kind of relief. And you couldn't stop chanting both the prayers to Lord Narsimhadev and the Maha Mantra. So we're in the back of this truck chanting away, I was. The African friend wasn't actually so interested as we thought he was. But uh, it was an amazing experience alone. No one on the planet knew where you were, practically speaking. And then suddenly the truck stops. Out come, uh, well, rather, another vehicle for some reason is coming on the opposite direction. And in a few moments, so the, the two vehicles stop. There's not enough room to pass each other. A man is shining a light into the back of our truck and he's talking in Swahili. And I'm asking my friend, what's he talking about? He said he's the assistant district commissioner who happened to be coming across, along the opposite direction, that laney little, little lane, lonely little lane in the jungle and has stopped the truck and is making an inquiry. And after some time, the truck started to maneuver to try to turn around and we were driving back towards the town. And then after whatever time, we were locked up in the prison. Apparently he said there had to be an inquiry into this and he was officially overseeing how Krishna's hand works, protecting internally and externally in this case. The internal protection is the real one. It's how Krishna really protects us. So we were back in the city or town, it wasn't really a city, in the jail. And funnily enough, it was much more fearful than when we were on the road to probably getting shot. So uh, I was alone there, the African boy, they didn't arrest him. They let him go because he was a Ugandan. And I was there for some days, I don't know how long. And it was the most horrific place perhaps I've ever seen in my life. It was definitely, the cell I was in was not so bad, but the cell you had to go into to pass stool and urine was definitely a lower planetary, very hellish place, extremely hell. Grew up here. I mean, I don't want to even describe it. It was so hellish. And I could not eat. Because the thought of going in there was just worse than death, practically. And I asked the man next to me, how long have you been here? 
in this prison? He said, I think it's about eight years. And I said, what are you here for? He said, I don't know. They never told me. I've never seen anyone I know in eight years. And then he said, this is what, they'll do this to you now as well. This is what they do to all the prisoners. You just get stuck there until you die. And then um, that was, oh, I, I wish I'd been shot. Fate worse than death. And for so four or five days or whatever, I don't know exactly, but I was in the prison. And then suddenly the district commissioner returned from his hunting. And he came in, said, what are you doing here? I said, I don't know. And he took, made an inquiry. He said, you shouldn't come here. He was Oxford educated. By the way, Parth, I first met your Parth Sarati Maharaj in Oxford in 1972, just before he joined the temple there. We were doing a program in Oxford. And... Uh, and Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj, of course, he spent lots of many years with Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj in the UK uh, before he also joined you there in Africa. So then after some time he came back and he said, you know, get out. He gave me my passport back of all things. He got me somehow or another. <laughs> he retrieved it and some money and we were sent packing back to Kenya, at least I was. It was quite an experience and how it all occurred with the eclipse of the sun, the fever. Fever went completely away. It's a good cure for a fever if you've got some COVID or some serious disease. It's, you know, something even more dramatic um, comes along. You can easily rise above it and completely forget. I saw everything as orchestrated by Krishna. This is the difference. Krishna is there for the devotees. Anyone who renders even a little service is guaranteed to be protected from the greatest dangers. Now, I've got to watch the time because you're quite strict here in Africa. In the Western world, or they say in Europe, we don't really bother much about time, but in Africa, I can see you're very serious about it. Um, and another time, now this is an interesting one, it was a little different. I was in Malaysia. This was in 1988, probably. And this is really an interesting story. I'm, I was going to read a lot, lot of Shastra and discuss, but because our time is short, I'll just tell a few stories that are a bit more interesting. So I was in Malaysia, and uh, Kurma Rupa Prabhu passed away. He was in the um, Care for Cows program in Vrindavan, passed away a few years ago. He was there at that time. He was one of the ashram teachers in the Vrindavan Gurukul. And he brought a group of kids from the Vrindavan Gurukul to Malaysia for the summer. And they were staying with us for a few months. It was nice, very nice. We had a few local boys who were also interested. One of them, I can't remember the name, Tiagaraja, I think it was something like that, was there with them. And, and he was a very interesting young man. A uh, very sharp and intelligent boy. And so he's very enthusiastic. And they decided he would go to the Vrindavan Gurukul. So um, his family were into it and he wanted it. And Kurma Rupa thought he was really good. So they made arrangements and Kurma Rupa took him down to the Indian High Commission to get visas. Once he was in the Indian High Commission, he went completely weird started, you know, talking in different voices and, you know, pushing and, no, no, he, he became strange. So then they brought him back to the uh, temple and he was really weird. I mean, he, he was like a different person altogether. And he was starting pushing people around, even four men couldn't hold him down practically. He was like, he had the strength of a, you know, wrestler, a powerful wrestler or something. This went on for a day or two, and then we realized that he was ghostly occupied, ghostly haunted. So somehow that we took him to one house outside the temple, and he was there, and uh, the roads were there kind of just keeping an eye, but he was behaving so strange. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I went there one time, and he was 
there and I was there and you know because I've been very involved in him up to that time in his uh, devotional progress and I looked at him and literally of course we can say everything is uh, is an illusion but then everything is an illusion in one sense we're not seeing it properly even death although it is a reality we could say in this world it's an illusion in a sense when we think of it from the spiritual point of view because the soul never dies it's another form of krishna for devotee krishna says you know i am all devouring death time i am to destroy all the worlds um it's a form of krishna in this world to try to um, you could say remind us the universal form is one of the methods of trying to Remember, there is a supreme controller. We're not the controller. So I looked at this boy and his eyes turned like emerald color. It was really weird. Then suddenly they turned into like, his teeth suddenly changed shape like they were like sharp pointed teeth like that of some kind of, you know, I don't know, tiger or something. And his eyes went green and he looked and he sort of snarled at me, snarled at me. And he said, Hare Krishna, Hare. I can also chant this Hare Krishna, he said. And then I kind of moved away. And it was really a strange experience. And then the next morning, I was, I was looking after, amongst other things, I was regional secretary, but I was also looking after the BBT. I was in the BBT office, and suddenly in the morning, I was about to leave for another part of Malaysia. And the boy came into my office. And he looked at me with these strange eyes and he went out. I don't know whether it was just a vision or what, but it was as true as day. And then we drove in the afternoon to this other town, myself and one other devotee. And it, normally we would go through a city called Ipoh and we were driving up the highway, which normally takes about three hours to Epo, and it took us about six, seven hours for some reason. Driving, driving, there was a storm, terrific storm. We're going up the highway, and we're reaching, and all the time, a truck is in front of us, and when we overtake it, it again would come in front, and on the back was a skull and crossbones. You know what that is? It was, I, I, my friend couldn't see, I was, it was me, I was seeing this. And I'm chanting, chanting, and what else do you do in a situation like this? You just chant, keep chanting. Krishna is preparing us for death. He's preparing us for the, we may think, you know, we don't need to worry now, but we should worry now. Lord Nishinga Dave. And Pallad, rather, Pallad Maharaj was preaching to the schoolboys, don't waste your time now. You never know when you're going to die. We've got to be serious and take advantage of this. So eventually, about midnight, we reached the town, Ipoh. That was only our halfway stop. We got to Ipoh about midnight. And I was pretty exhausted. And I went to take rest. And then, boom. If ever you've read the story of Dhruva Maharaj and the Yakshas and the various myst the mystic Yakshas and all the various hallucinations which appeared before, to their magic tricks, before the vision of Dhruva, it was something like that. It was unbelievable experience. And, and uh, I just immediately jumped up. There was no question of sleep. And I got this I ran down to the little temple. It was a small temple. Down to the temple room. And I sat in a temple, chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. In front, there was a, a week before I donated to the temple a beautiful poster of Lord Nishimidev. And I sat in front of that poster of Lord Nishimidev and just chanted and chanted and chanted. And sometimes I lost my legs. It was like there was someone else was occupying them, my arm. It was amazing. It was like a, a battle going on almost. And then rattling on the, the doors were rattling, the windows were rattling. I could hear noises and bangs and different things were going on. I just kept chanting and chanting and chanting. We didn't know whether we were going to exist or survive. And then I learned about 4.15, we had no deities in that temple. 
four fifteen or something. I was just going last desperately. I was like desperately chanting. There was, and suddenly, boom! It all went away. I just chanting. It was time for Mangalarti. All night chanting. And it's a very, very long story, and it goes on for a, a few more days in different places. But the gist of it is that this uh, young man um, was possessed by various genies, ghosts and genies. And when the idea of his going to India came up, they reacted because they cannot cross over the water. So they prevented him from going. And uh, when he was in this house, we brought one man, Indian man, who apparently removed them, or some of them. And those genies were chasing us up the highway. And because uh, they need, they're looking for somewhere, somewhere to live, <laughs> like every one of us. And so they were chasing. And whilst I was on this journey, and the devotee, one senior devotee from Kuala Lumpur, flung up, are you okay? I said, I'm fine. He said, why, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm fine. What about the other device? He said, he's fine too. It's very strange, he said, because the, this man who removed the ghost said that those ghosts have followed you up the highway, trying to get you. I said, oh, really, that's interesting. I'll tell you about it when we get back. Well, that, there was more to it, but it was just another experience of how important it is that death, life is a preparation really for death. It's not that life is... That's it. Life is meant as a preparation. So in different ways, we could say that's not exactly a near-death experience, but it's, it's a wake-up call to remind us and to show us that our only shelter is the holy name. The only shelter is the lotus feet of Krishna. Now, our time is running. I'm just going to read a few quotes, and then we'll probably have to finish. And I can't tell other stories. No time. Prabhupada, uh, in a lecture in 1975, he said, therefore, before your next death, you realize Krishna. Durabham, manasham janma, tadapjadruvam. Atardham means even if you live for a few years, and if you take the chance of chanting Hare Krishna, still you are benefited. You are still benefited. So this chanting of Hare Krishna is so important. You can think always that death is coming. Death is at my door. Let me finish my chanting. Let me finish my chanting. Yes, we can never finish our chanting. We should always keep chanting. Always you should think like that, that death is already coming. Let me chant. So this is called Bhagavad Dharma. And Krishna conscious movement means Bhagavad Dharma. So you read Prahlad Maharaj's instructions very nicely and utilize it in your life. Your life will be successful. And just a few tips on what we're supposed to do um, and where the, uh, the security or the protection comes from death. The devotees, this is from the 10th Canto of Bhagavatam, 87.27. And <clears throat> the devotees who worship you as a shelter of all beings disregard death and place their feet on his head. And you're placing your feet, because we wouldn't want to literally do that. You could say this is a figurative statement. And death is not only Krishna himself says he's death personified or, or devouring death, but it's also Yamaraj. So Yamaraj is a great devotee of the Lord. So he's also there for the devotees. He's, he's not according to the teachings of uh, in the sixth canto, in the pastime of a jami, oh, we, we hear there how the Vishnu Dutas accost, stop the Yama Dutas from taking Ajumil and, and very severely admonish them for uh, trying to touch anyone who's chanted the holy name of Krishna. So, not that we should take that for granted, but nonetheless, it's the statement in Bhagavatam. Placing his head at the feet of the deity, he should then stand with folded hands before the Lord and pray. Oh, my Lord, please protect me, who am surrendered unto you. I am most fearful of this ocean of material existence, standing as I am in the mouth of death. Yes, we're on the door of death every moment. We forget this. Um, most of the time we want to forget it. Because being, especially if we're on the bodily platform of life, it's, uh, it's not a very welcome thought. 
But for those on the platform, on the spiritual platform, it's not an unwanted thought. It's, it's, it's uh, what does it mean? It just means change your body or release of this body and go into the spiritual plane. Whichever, it's not a fearful thought for the devotees. O Sutta Goswami, there are those amongst men who desire to become free from death and get eternal life instead of a short life. They escape the slaughtering process by calling the controller of death, Yamaraj. An interesting statement. Um, the other quote I read just now is 11th canto, 2747. This one is from the first canto, chapter 16, text 7. I would like to read what Prabhupada said because it's relevant. The living entity, as he develops from lower animal life to a higher human being and gradually higher intelligence, becomes anxious to get free from the clutches of death. And who isn't there in the world who wants to be free of death? Some people may be suffering too much or they're mad or something. But most people do not want to die. Even animals, insects, they don't want to die. It's a totally unnatural thing for the soul. The material wood is by nature unnatural for the soul, we know that. But death is one of the most unnatural, birth and death, totally unnatural. Birth is so painful we can't remember it. But uh, death is definitely unnatural, we don't want to die. And we don't really die as we know. But we experience what, because we're so attached to the body, so everything that we're identifying with is taken away, except for the karmic reaction to lead us to our next experience. But basically our, our possessions, our body, our family, everything. We and we're going into a world of darkness, of fear. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what's happening. Terrific pain, lack of control. Everything we don't want comes upon us, basically speaking. No matter whether we're a, a big scientist or a simpleton, it doesn't matter what we are. The same thing happens to everyone. The final result of our lifetime is death. And people are not prepared for it. And they're, maybe they're in great fear and anxiety, pain, who knows. Modern scientists try to avoid death by physiochemical advancement of knowledge, but also, alas, alas, brothers, the control of death, Yamaraj, is so cruel, he does not spare even the very life of the scientist himself. The scientist who puts forth the theory of stopping death by advancement of scientific knowledge becomes himself a victim of death when he is called by Yamaraj. Well, to speak of stopping death, no one can enhance the short period of life even by a fraction of a moment. The only hope of suspending the cruel slaughtering process of Yamaraj is to call him to hear and chant the holy name of the Lord. Yamaraj is a great devotee of the Lord, and he likes to be invited to kirtan and sacrifices by the pure devotees who are constantly engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. Thus, the great sage Headed by Shonak and others invited Yamaraj to attend the sacrifice performed at Naimishranya. This was good for those who did not want to die. I'm not quite sure how we invite Yamaraj to our kirtans, but <laughs> I don't think we have to worry. I'm sure he's going to be there if he wants to be. We invite him by trying to be serious and pure in our chanting. Try to take shelter of the holy name. This is how we'll be protected from the Let's say the fears, not just death itself, but the fear of death, takes shelter of the holy name Krishna. And we see also in the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Shuman Bhagavatam, uh, that uh, the holy name is feared by fear personified. It's the only way to overcome the fear of death. As long as Yamaraj, who causes everyone's death, is present here, no one shall meet with death. The great sages have invited the controller of death. Yamaraj, who is the representative of the Lord. So in one sense, if he's there, he, he can't be there in his role to punish you from death. You know? he's, he's intending the kirtan, you have to wait. Living beings who are under his grip should take advantage of hearing the deathless nectar in the form of this narration of the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. Okay, well, I... Ah, no, here's the last... Last two little things that I'll, I'll mention. This is from the Nectar of Devotion, although it refers to Srimad Bhagavatam. Maharaj Parikshit met Shukadeva Goswami just a week before his death, and the king was perplexed as to what should be done before he was to pass on. Many other sages also arrived there, 
And whatever we are, we might be a week, a month, a year, 10 years, 20, 50, we don't know. But death is certainly coming to all of us, as sure as death, so we say. And we should be preparing for it. Help each other be conscious. Not that we're just talking of death, we're talking of Krishna, Krishna consciousness. But that is the preparation. Um, hmm. Many other sages arrived. But no one could give him the proper direction. Sukadeva Goswami, however, gave this direction to him as follows. My dear king, if you want to be fearless in meeting your death next week, Branch Prabhu says, everyone is afraid at the point of death. Then you must immediately begin the process of hearing and chanting and remembering God. If one can chant and hear Hare Krishna and always remember Lord Krishna, then he is sure to become fearless. Cool. Fearless of death, which may come at any moment. Any moment. So Prabhupada also taught us, in, in Prabhupada's own words, he taught us how to leave this body in 1977. Although I guess we're, we've all had some familiarity with Sri Prabhupada's last pastimes of leaving this world. And Prabhupada, one time he said, I want to die on the battlefield preaching, just like Arjuna. We hear different statements of a similar kind but that was Prabhupada's desire he wanted to die fighting for the mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu so learning as Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj would say learning to die before we die surrendering surrendering to the holy name absorbing sent this uh, Krishna Kata and giving our lives for the Sankirtan movement this is our protection well, I'm sorry to say, we, we wanted to do a few more things, but our time is up and we'll have to uh, open up now. If anyone has any questions, comments, or whatever you want. It's such a matter a little different this morning. But we're there, you know, actually all around us um, is always, you could say, we're surrounded by Danger, Sanasati, Padabalava, Plavam, Mahapudna, Nishoma, Rahare, Dampunya, Yashoma, Rahare. But we're a danger. Danger is there at every step. The only shelter is we take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Danger is there at every moment. It's not just because we have right now, whatever, COVID, coronavirus threats in different places of the world. And we hear of so many people related or not related but passing away from covid and so on and many 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 people are very afraid they're fearing they're, they're in fear mode and devotee is not in fear mode at least we shouldn't be take this as an opportunity to enhance our sankirtan movement it's a good opportunity to preach more about you know the, the, the danger of, of this world and the effects of fear and you know, death is, is, is just the physical experience, which we experience on the mental plane, of course. Um, but it's a good opportunity to preach. Okay, so maybe there are some comments in the chat. Let's see. Usa. Well, let's see. If there's, before. there's a lot on here. Um, Start with a short music. Uh, a There's a, a comment and a question by Joanna Patri Jotimai. She wrote it on Facebook. She says, right. Hare Krishna, thank you so oh, much. For this I've got podcast. it here. Yeah. You can see it, right? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. I don't know if everyone can see it or not. I, I don't know. Yeah, we can. Everyone can see it? Yeah. Okay, so you can see in the chat there's something here from Joanna. Or Jyoti Mai. Um, I don't know where we are, Pretoria or somewhere in South Africa, I guess. A Kadamba Kanan Raj disciple by the looks of it. Yeah, my base Facebook. It keeps reminding me. Uh, so d -d 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 death is something that is always in my mind. It keeps reminding me I'm not limitless. You know, we're not limitless. We're certainly controlled. Sometimes people would challenge Prabhupada. I don't have to surrender. Why are you telling me I have to surrender? I don't need to surrender. I would say, well, you have to surrender to death. You know, people don't, they, they don't want to accept it. As if we can overcome death. So many people, even the Ranya Kashi, Ravana, 
They all tried to overcome death and conquer death, but they were defeated. They were defeated. No one can overcome it because it's just, we're not the controller. Krishna is. Krishna is. And uh, we, we either surrender to him in love or we surrender him to by force, but we can't avoid it. Same time, I can't understand how people act like they are eternal. Even people of old age, like my mother. Why do they not take care of their souls when they see that the end is so close? Why do they not go close to God? Aren't they afraid of death or they are petrified or the consequences of their life? Thank you, Dr. Mai Devi Dasi, Hare Krishna. I don't know, don't think I know who you are, but you're obviously a fortunate soul attached to Srila Prabhupada. Well, let's read the famous verse from the Mahabharata. Ahanyahani Bhutani Gachanti Haya Malayam Seshastavaram Ichanti Kim Ascharya Matakparam. Every day, hundreds of millions of living entities go to the kingdom of death. Hundreds of millions, billions. I mean, we can't imagine how many are dying. Of course, they may not go to the court of Yamaraj, actually. Most of them are in the insect, animal, fish form of life. But uh, throughout the universe, we can hardly imagine how many living entities there are. Hundreds and millions of living entities go to the kingdom of death every day. Still, those who are remaining aspire for a permanent situation. What could be more astonishing than this? So that's one of the famous questions which the Yaksha or Yamaraj himself asked Yudhisthir. Um, what is the... This is the question was, what is the most wonderful thing in the world? Well, if you ask somebody what the most wonderful thing in the world, not many people would answer that. So um, Prabhupada often uh, translates this as everyone around you is dying, but we think it will never happen to us. It's a different way of saying that we're, we, we, we all, we're, we're living in this world as if it would never happen. Um, we're trying for a permanent life. People are in illusion. They've been, because of ignorance, people don't, they've not been educated They've been educated to believe in science, to believe in, you know, all these type of things, that medicine will cure us. When Prabhupada was in his last months in Vrindavan, many people came to different cures, you know, uh, Ayurveda, this thing, that thing, and astrologers would come. And Prabhupada would accept their efforts, but, you know, he, nothing really, physically speaking, worked much. And because Prabhupada, it wasn't the main lesson that Prabhupada's teaching that we should fight against it, you know. Um, but most people think we should. And the other side of it is, and Prabhupada said at that time, we should just chant. This is great. This is the perfection of life. And you know that. So, mom, why she's not, and why most other people are not? Well, they're, first of all, they're, it's a kind of a, thought you don't really want to entertain. It means surrender to Krishna. And the other thing is that they're intoxicated with material life. People, sometimes Prabhupada said it, it's like the ostrich which sticks its head into the sand when the enemy is coming, you know? The enemy of death is coming. So we try to avoid thinking about it, bury our heads into something else. Huh? Try to get absorbed. I remember when my father passed away, I wasn't there, but I was there just a few days afterwards. It's a long story also. I won't tell it. But then when my mother passed away, it so happened. I was living in New Zealand when they both passed away. And, uh, and some or another was there a few days afterwards. And when my mother, before my mother passed away, I went to visit her one year, maybe a year before she passed away. And my mother hated football. In England, we call it football. Maybe you call it soccer. I don't know. He really didn't like it, but my father was a, very much into it. And uh, when I went to see her, she wouldn't talk to me practically. A few words, she was, her eyes were fixed on the television watching football. She never did it when, I, when she, before my father passed away, but she identified so much with my father. It was like, she had no other identification practically. It was like their whole life. And now she was just doing them, trying to do the things that she hated just so she felt his presence, you know, so attached, oblivious, almost oblivious to what was going on around her. It was kind of, phew, it was a real wake up call. And then sometime after she passed away, I don't know what she was thinking of when she passed away, probably, probably her husband, I don't know. But people get so much, you know, 
absorb, try to absorb their minds in, in something else. So you can hardly get through to them. Uh, they're oblivious to you know anything outside of their limited experience. So they try to take shelter of whatever they think is shelter. Nothing is shelter really, but we're all looking for shelter. The soul by nature is looking for shelter. Everyone needs shelter. We can't exist. The earth is sheltering us, so many things. We're all looking for shelter. But we're just taking shelter, as Bhagavatam also says, Atma Sanyasu Satsupin. That uh, we're taking shelter of fallible soldiers. They can't really protect us. Ravana took shelter of his mystic powers and his weapons and so on, his Yaksha associate, his Rakshasa associates. Didn't protect him, ultimately. Death came, and it's the same with everyone, but even to the point of death, Ravana was you now determined, determined not to, to face it, you know, determined to defeat the enemy. Maybe the scientists, maybe the scientists will, will save me. Maybe medicine can save me. Many people think like that. But uh, no matter what it does, it just puts off the inevitable, at most if that's your karma. Because people, the basic problem is people are so entrenched in ignorance that you know when you when you're in the, when you're underground, you can't see the sun. It just hardly has any effect. But still, your good wishes, Otimaya's good wishes for her mother will save her. Even though she may or may not be showing any interest whatsoever in spiritual life, your good wishes will save her from what we say the normal karmic cycle. So the devotee by Aaron Devers, it's Pilad Maharaj, when Shingadev gave him the benediction, he said, you don't need to worry, already 21 generations before and after have been delivered because you are a pure devotee. We may not be so pure, so the effect may not be so great, but there'll still be an effect on our family and those we've had, you know, somewhat close contacts with, etc. We'll get some benefit for sure. So don't be afraid. Maybe some are not ready yet, but they're they they're getting a gyata sakriti. They're getting good fortune by being in a family where there's devotees or hearing from the devotees something, even if they didn't agree with it. Maybe they got prashadam. Good fortune. So don't be you know too worried. Uh, what is the consequence? What would you do? What am I changing to move? What would you do if you see someone in fear? Can a devotee also act like Krishna, remove the fear of someone else without being the person's guru? Well, in, I mean, everyone to different degrees, of course, have fear of something. Maybe we have fear of you know, loss or fear of death or fear of ill health or fear of people or fear of something or another, pretty much. Fear of, I mean, some people are afraid of mice, even. Some people are afraid of, you know, spiders, cockroaches, you know, bees. Um, some people are afraid, you know, everyone, fear is there with all of us in the material world. It's not a question of, and but some people are naturally more, you could say, uh, manifesting, almost pervasively afraid. They're just paranoid of, it could be the going out. I mean, many people have a phobia of being in crowds or uh, they've had some experience in the past, et cetera. All these various, they've got some scars, impressions that people have and their false identities with this body, which cause people to um, fear. You know, fear is a result of identifying false identity um, with the body, you know, mind and so on and so forth. Uh, so naturally fear. We're afraid of other nations sometimes um, because we've been taught in such and such a way. We've heard something or another. Um, so many things we're afraid of. Going to the dentist. When we were kids, that was one of the big fears that we kids had was going to the dentist. It was like going to the court of Yamaraj. Practically speaking. <laughs> Horrendous. The dentist was the most unpopular person. You know, I mean, nice guy probably, but just for us kids, he was like, ah, he was like the devil, like the devil personified him. You know? And uh, 
anyway, we all got different fears. We may be afraid of going on stage. We may be afraid of going on the field. You know, it's like butterflies, different degrees of fear, all based on this bodily identification. So what can we do? Oh, we can try to get, okay, no worries. Let's just try to sit down and try to chant with me. Let's do a bit of chanting together. And I've got some nice food here too. We can share it, okay? You know, you don't necessarily, it depends on the person. It's not a question you can necessarily give, you know, an absolute to, but somehow or another, try to help them to take shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna. This will help to alleviate, maybe not immediately, entirely, maybe for some time. Prabhupada does say that if we come together for kirtan, then fear goes away. As we've just read also, Yamaraj's presence. So we chant the Hari, try to chant together, or somehow or another try to get them to take prasadam. Well, here's something, something which will, will be fearless, something which will help them to maybe a little, sometimes you can speak a little philosophy depending on the situation. Have you ever considered that maybe there's more to life than meets the eye? Maybe because we haven't looked down that avenue, that that's maybe one reason why we, we not just you, we are so afraid or we have so many concerns or anxieties. Maybe there's something else. Maybe we're just looking a little bit in the wrong direction for the solution here. Why don't we look at something else? Let's look in the, no, 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 not interested, not interested. Don't believe in all this stuff. Well, what can you say? We just try to, okay, well, what can we do? We try to get them to chant Hare Krishna or something at least. Many people, they don't want. They don't want. They have no faith in anything else. Their faith is so rooted in materialism, so rooted that uh, they can't hear, practically speaking. So the real solution is we ourselves. Look what Prabhupada did. I mean, look how pretty much everyone who came in touch with Sri Prabhupada had, uh, you know, some extraordinary uplift in their spiritual lives. No matter who they were, practically, they started at least think about it. Almost everyone, maybe some people were so covered, but generally speaking, and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people took shelter of the holy name. Sri Prabhupada is completely fixed at the lotus feet of the Lord. So the solution, in one sense, is uh, within, within, within us is Krishna. We have to take shelter of Krishna, take shelter of his lotus feet, and Krishna will then empower the devotee as an instrument for his mercy to wake up the living entities. It's like when we're in a sleep. You know, what can you do when you're sleeping? Not much, a little bit, but not much. We're pretty helpless just witnessing all these, whatever they are, different experiences. We don't know what's coming next when we're dreaming. Um, then when we wake up, it's all gone. It's like, like the illusion of the actions to do them. It's all gone. I like that. And we take shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna and uh, become empowered so that we can, others may be affected more by your association. Uh, otherwise, it's just a matter of trying to remember various experiences, different catchphrases, different things, you know, is the, by the association of devotees that people are changed. Merely by the association, Krishna works with his pure devotee. We can use some, it's like book distribution, you can use techniques and this, and those all may be very helpful up to a certain point, but ultimately as a matter of consciousness, as a matter of consciousness also, when someone is very dull, dark, and the body is very bright, and they may run away because of various reasons, but otherwise if the time is right, then they'll be enlightened by the association of the devotees, they can wake up. Next one. Um, how can a devotee in fear? We've done that. We spoke a little bit. What is the consequence of utterance of Krishna's name without thinking of him at the time of death? Is it like the Ajumal pastime? It could be. It depends. Um, Ajumal, of course, didn't go back to Godhead straight away. He had to go. He went to hardware for some time to perfect his chanting. Um, so, but it's that's the same thing. It protects us from having to go to the court of Yamaraj or taking useless births. 
one will take birth, as Krishna says, to Arjuna and his family more favorable to perceive, to continue with one's devotional service. So if we're, even if we are unconscious, I had an interesting experience, and I've shared it before, I'll share it again, because some of you are a new audience. Um, and in this experience was here at New Mayapur about five years ago, four years, I can't remember. But it was at midnight again, almost. We just came back from Sankirtan. We, we have this one day fest called Music Fest in, in France, where they did have until Corona came. Every year, one day, June the 21st, I think it's summer, summer solstice, they have this fest and you can chant all day long. Anyone can make as much noise as they like in the cities of France. So we used to go out and do a big Harry Nam on that day or night, especially at night, people come out. And we, we, let, we went on to about 10 o'clock and the hours drive us. And we came back to New Mayapur. Harry Nam Rushi were with us that day. And uh, I was, because it was very late and uh, you know, the temple devotees, if they hadn't come with us, had already gone to bed. And uh, I was basically having to organize accommodation and food, prasadam and so on for the Hainan Rushi Prize. So I was running up and down the stairs. Um, we have marble spiral staircase here in New Mayapur. Well, not maybe marble, but stone at least. And I was running up and down the stairs. And when I was running down one time, the light wasn't on properly. So I didn't really see as much as a spiral staircase. So the stairs are wider at one end and thin at the other. And I missed a step. I, I, I don't know how many steps I was before the bottom, maybe five, six, seven. I just don't know. It was some distance from the bottom. My right foot missed the step, twisted over. I was going fast. I was trying to get things done quick. And my right foot just lost it and it span over. And my whole, I went flying forward towards the ground, marble floor, and bang, my head hit the ground with a smack. And my left hand took some of the blow and my head took the rest. And I hit the deck. I thought I'd smashed my skull open, but totally unbecoming and unknown to me, out of my mouth came the roaring sound of Krishna. I never thought, but it came out. Krishna! Normally that wouldn't be the case. We would normally say, ouch, or ah, or something crazy. Jesus! I mean, that's not so bad, I suppose. <laughs> but, well, you wouldn't say anything, you were so blasted. But it was a crack. I could hear my head go crack on the ground. I, I thought it was, you know, split open. With my, my left hand was completely shattered, not shattered, but twisted. And it went up in the air, you know, like fire on the end of the arm. I left, my right foot went up like fire on, on the end of my leg. And uh, my head, I thought, would be a, you know, a bloodbath. I put my right hand over my head and nothing, not even a single drop of blood. There was not even a scratch on my head. And it was quite mystical. My hand and foot were out, but, but not the head. It was interesting. But the most interesting thing was that Krishna was there that he reminds us it's not exactly within our power to say, remember or not remember. You know, sort of a button goes off. Remember Krishna now. Maybe not. Krishna can do that. The point is that we should be practicing remembering Krishna. That's what Bhakti Tirtha means. Learning to die before you die. But, you know, just probably even said one time how we should chant. He said, you should chant as if this is your last breath. How would you chant if you knew you had 10? Prakshit Maharaj had seven days. He knew he had seven days. And he's showing us by example. The whole seven days was 24-7 here in Bhagavad Gita, preparing for the final moment. So what should we doing? Anti Narayana Smriti asked Sukadev. What should we be doing at the time of death? Anti Narayana Smriti. We should be remembering the Lord at the time of death. But we have to practice now. We can't expect. We depend on Krishna at the time of death. The devotee is dependent. There are so many stories. I've only heard a few, but I've heard there are many of devotees at the time of death, how Krishna came to them at the time of death, or Prabhupada came to them at the time, same thing. At that moment, um, Krishna's there, but he's seeing, he's watching. And it's not within our power to say, I will remember Krishna at the time of death. It's a nice thought, but we should practice now so that Krishna will remind us at the time of death, whether we do or whether we don't. If we're chanting Krishna's name, we're very fortunate, guaranteed. But uh, if the more we take seriously now, the more chance, say chance, but the more likelihood 
there is a Krishna who will be very pleased and he'll be there. You won't have a choice. You forget or not forget, but if Krishna is right there in front of your consciousness, that's it. He's with us. He's with him. And everybody, Prabhupada said, every single person who has some other come in contact with Krishna consciousness in whatever form is guaranteed that, you know, that at the time of death, they will get good, there will be good fortune for them, whether they have to take birth again or whatever happens. But uh, they will be saved. Saved from the greatest danger of having to fall back into lower species of life and waste their human life away. It means they've, they've not wasted their life. So what to speak of somebody who's trying to be a devotee or trying to be a follower of a devotee? Most fortunate. No, we don't put no sense. Is that it? No, there's one more, I think. I found many devotees who were fearing. Oh, Jyoti Ma is in Italy, Hare Krishna. Who were fearing from their Guru Maharaj. Yeah? I found many devotees who were fearing from their Guru Maharaj, fearing to meet him, to come close to him. In a certain period of time, I had the same feeling. Oh, yes. Well, why do we fear? I guess you have to ask yourself, why are you afraid as well? It may be various reasons. I mean, an element of fear is not necessarily bad. Some kind of, it has a, a familiarity is not so good. Sometimes we get over familiar. Um, there's a place for both, but there's an element of fear which is required to keep some reverence or keep some respect in place. But if it's all pervasive fear, we have to ask why. It's sometimes based on the fact that we're hiding something or we're afraid to be revealed. Sometimes, it may not always be. There may be other factors. And you can't necessarily put an ABC to this one. Um, but we have to see what is the cause of our fear in uh, something which is more of a, a very personal thing. Um, we can discuss with others who are close to the spiritual master. Is there anything you could do? Am I, is this correct? Is my attitude correct? Or is it, is it something which is actually preventing me from you know, properly serving my spiritual master or associating with them, etc.? Discuss with those who are a little bit closer to him. I don't mean close enough necessarily in a kind of a very, very familiar way, but those who are serving him, maybe his servants or some of those who are, don't have so much of a, um, you know, a fear of, of I mean, but there's always, for many of us, and perhaps for most of us, there's a little fear of, of in, in this regards. It may come out differently, but with Prabhupada, there was definitely a fear of, of, of uh, you know, being too, too close because, you know, naturally we're very small when you're in the presence of someone who's very great. But Prabhupada was such that he would not make one fear when you're in his association. And... I, I most likely, if you if you if you find out, but most likely that fear can go away with a little bit more kind of experience. So discuss the uh, the situation with those who are a little closer and see what you can who can kind of maybe overcome that fear. It's usually bound on ignorance. Fear is bound on ignorance in general, um, and when ignorance is removed. Um, on both our side as well as our understanding maybe, then oftentimes it's not such of a, a concern, let's say. But the element of fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I've heard in Bhagavatam that Shukracharya had the power to bring people back from death. In this way, the demons were able to escape death until Prince by the sun came down to learn this vidya in a way that demons were able to escape death. How would Shukracharya have the power to control death like Krishna? Whoa, my goodness. Um, maybe we should start calling Shukracharya. <laughs> Sounds like he's a pretty good doctor. Um, he'd be very popular, I'm sure of that, in this day and age. Well, you know, everyone's empowered by Krishna. Even if someone does have, by, you know, dipping them into a a vat of nectar or some Im of immortality or something, but there's no one's ultimately immortal, by the way, even if you could bring them back to life at that point of time, whatever karmic reason or other reason it may be, uh, ultimately everyone in this world, even Brahma, dies or leaves his body. 
So ultimately, no one can stop that. For some time, uh, it may be, we may even see that the medical medicine, medical doctors appear to extend people's lives. But it's all related to karma, um, and it's all related to a particular, um, let's say, arrangement of the Lord. So whether it's Shukracharya, or whether it's, you know, Brispati or whoever it may be, um, they, they can't do anything without the impact that those powers can be taken away in a moment. So the Lord may empower a living entity to do these things which would normally not be seen possible. Um, we see so many times, of course, in the case of the Battle of Lanka, Lord Ram was there, but still he's, you know, he's, he's asking benedictions that all the monkeys should be brought back to life and so on and so forth. Um, eh, nothing is impossible. Nothing's impossible. They were generally speaking, uh, there were certain, even with those procedures, it wasn't, we see that Narada Muni also brought Chittaketu, uh, son back to life. And uh, for a period of time, um, usually when the body is still at a certain stage, these, there is a possibility these kind of, because the soul hasn't yet entered another body, if you're looking at it mechanically, and the body may still be, let's say, in some cases, it may, you know, like on a battlefield, it's not like it's died of old age necessarily. And all the organs are wiped out. It's probably a little bit more realistic to think that they could bring the soul back in anyway. But the soul hasn't yet taken another birth in another body. But sometimes, by various means, if Krishna gives the empowerment, they can do so. There is science. And sometimes people appear to leave their bodies and they bring them back in and so on. So even medicine sometimes, a little bit, sometimes that happens. What to say? If it's a person's karma, if it's the will of the Lord, you may empower a living entity to do these activities. But it's not, it's not that they have overcome death, because death will still come. You know, yogis may live 700 or more years, but death comes. No one can stop death eventually. One may, or again, may or may not, depending on one's karma and the will of the Lord, one's deserve, um, extend one's life, maybe. But so what? What's the point unless one's actually better a moment of full consciousness, a long life of, you know, material karmas and so on and so forth. So the point is not just to extend life. The extent, the point is, as, as even Lincoln said this, it's not the years in your life that matter, but the life in your years. It's what we do with our life that counts, not how many years we live. Jesus was only maybe 32, 33 years, Buddha 40, Lord Chaitanya 48. It's not how many years. I want to live a lot longer. I've got a lot more to do. It's not necessarily like that. Don't worry, you'll carry on in the next life doing it. You know, if you think you've got to, you know, collect a lot of, you know, enjoy a lot of eating or something still and you can take birth in your next life as a pig you know carry on nicely eating without any problems you know it's it's uh it doesn't come to an end like that this life or the next life life is eternal you have to understand the basic principles of soul is eternal and it's this body or the next body so what unless we utilize our human form of life for god realization it's a shrama eva he gave them it's a waste of time Life's desires are not meant to sense gratification. One's meant to live, yeah, keep a little healthy, but the point is we're meant to utilize our lives to inquiring into the nature of the absolute truth. That should be the goal of all of our works. Hare Krishna, all glories to Prabhupada. Thank you very much. That's the end of the chats, I think. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Maharaj. Thank you. Uh, for the class. And the story is amazing in Uganda. So we yeah, would... Uganda. Oh, well, we had a yeah, quite an interesting. Those days it was rather wild, you know. And that is, I've not been back since then, but I've heard it's much more kind of organized now. It was like a bomb site when we were there. Kampala was like a bomb site. Building everything, well, not everything, but so much smashed. Where they, you know. Idi Amin smashed things as he left. The Tanzani army smashed things as they came in. It was a real mess. It's a material world. 
So the class was thoroughly enjoyed by the devotees. We can see. <laughs> hope uh, we can. And we're watching on Facebook. Is that right? Yes, Marge. Yes. Okay. And we'll just the one that's on Zoom were my disciples, as far as I can see. Mm. They've come in full force. So Marge can be found on social media also, on Facebook. Uh, I'm, not on, I'm not on Facebook. Someone is managing it for you. Yeah. Oh, really? I never, I don't know. <laughs> have to ask them and see if you know who they are. It's me. Oh, it's Stephen Underpro. He sat next to me. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he's doing. I wonder what he's doing on the phone. <laughs> so your preaching is expanded everywhere, Maharaj. You can follow Maharaj at His Holiness Jananda Goswami okay. on Facebook. Follow me. And, I'm not on Facebook. How do you follow me on Facebook? You get Jeevananda. <laughs> the other day, someone someone phoned up. They said, "Is that Jeevananda, Maharaj?" <laughs> <laughs> your your work is put there by Jeevananda, Maharaj. Your I see. That's by Jeevananda, Maharaj puts it there. Does he? Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, God, when you come into France again, Savia? Uh, when they allow us, marriage to, to, to fly. It's been... <laughs> what do you say? When they allow to fly. Again. When they allow to fly. I was going to come to Africa, wasn't I? No, it wasn't. I was going to, uh, what was I going to do? One devotee in Africa. Anyway, it just never got, it never got back to me. Okay. Mm. So, anyway, we've come to the end of the session. And so we're just formally uh, thanking you, Maharaj, for spending the time with us. And all the devotees who have come, we we're very happy to host you on Wake Up South Africa. So our announcements are just were there to show we have a social media presence. If you can uh, follow us, like, share, and follow at WUSA108. You can email us at admin at wusa.online. Wake up, oh, that stands for Wake Up South Africa. Yes, Chief wow. Jago. <laughs> yes. And uh, our website is, uh, as you can see, www.wusa.online. We are trying to build a following. So if you can like and bring us to about a thousand page likes to access more facilities on the platform. We also have um, a link for our updates. It's a WhatsApp group. You can receive regular activity updates and communication. This group is for quick announcements and will not be used for spam. So only the admins can post. Our JAPA is back and uh, you can access that link via the updates on WhatsApp. Uh, on that note, we just want to make a quick update on the fundraiser of the WUSA Preaching Initiative that we're Sankitan Bas has been ticked off the Wusa wish list. I'd like to thank those who helped us to get the bus. And also the Wusa House Yoga Studio is nearing completion. Uh, we thank all those who opened their hearts to us and donated towards uh, the preaching effort. Mm -hmm. We still are having some items. Hey, where is that? Where is it? This is in Johannesburg in Melville, Marge. This wow. way right now all right so um, anyone who would like to help with uh expanding this preaching work please look on www.wusa.online for more information and also email us so thank you very very much to all the devotees for spending this time and we hope marge we can have your association again soon and uh chila the key yeah, hi, Hari Bo. Thank you, Savya Sachi and all the devotees. Hare Krishna. We have that. Uh, um, we will send Maharaj your class and so that it can go everywhere. So after this small presentation of the wish list, uh, the session will close off in song. And so feel free to see until the end. Hare Krishna. Not sure what we're doing now. What's happening? We're just gonna hear the song, Maharaj. And then what song you're singing today? Coming through. Ooh, and then we do the dance. Wake up South Africa.
Africa. You sleeping for too long. Wake up, South Africa. Now come along and sing this song. Wake up, South Africa. Haribo. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hey again. Swami Jai. Swami Ki Jai. Prabhupad Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. <laughs> My name is Geeta and the first book that I ever read was Chant and Be Happy and uh, how to make me feel. What it meant to me was um, that, so when I got that book, I um, had walked into the, the, the um, temple and asked them if I could please have access to the Vedas. So they gave me Chant and Be Happy and I said, okay, thank you, but I would also like to read the Vedas. And they said, first read this, and they gave me beads, and they gave me chant and be happy. So I went home and I read it immediately, and I was very satisfied and very intrigued. And I came back the next day, and I said, thank you. Can I read the Vedas? <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they gave me, this is okay, just hold on, just slow down. And then they gave me uh, SSR, which I started to read, but then I, I did also start to attend some kirtan nights at the temple and some yoga. Um, yeah, yoga. And um, so I started reading SSR and I still to this day haven't actually finished it, um, but it's a very good book. And Chant and Be Happy was very cool because it got me more into the Kirtan culture and then obviously the Holy Name hooked me from there. Um, then it was a while later that I got to the Bhagavad Gita and once I got to the Gita then I was, that was sold. Actually the first day I opened the Gita I distributed one as well. Because <laughs> I was started writing notes immediately and then someone knocked on the gate going, what is this place? And I went, okay, <laughs> five things you need to know. <laughs> and yeah, so Prabhupada um, and his style of writing definitely got me from the beginning and I appreciated it. And yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. 